The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Legend Point Castle Bar. You're listening to The Crypt, and today's special guest is John Duggan, who played Grandpa in the cult classic The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So you're very welcome to the show, John. Hello. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Well, John, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre was your first major role. So what was your background in acting up to that point? I had, no, that was my first film. I was a theater actor. I was, a, as a matter of fact, I was still in uh, theater school at the time. I was between my second and third year, and uh, I was actually doing a children's play when I got the call to do uh, Chainsaw. So I went from dancing around in party-colored tights entertaining children to... <laughs> <laughs> getting a girl over the head with a sledgehammer <laughs> the same summer. It, it was a summer I became a... I got paid for both gigs. That's um, crazy. The complete so, opposites. Yeah. <laughs> and then, when when you got the role of Grandpa, what description was given to you of the character? The one, the key word that the Kim Hankel gave me was that he was an embryonic old man. He was so old that he started reverting into... Yeah, a child, an embryo. Really, gone. You know, he was embryonic. Was the term that yeah. the Kim used? And he was so freaky looking. What was the makeup process like for him? The, the, make- oh, God, the makeup was awful. Uh, makeup has gotten uh, much more comfortable in the last forty years. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was liquid. It was liquid latex, which uh, um, they don't they can be used for years. That method is totally outdated. Uh, but like I said, this was 43 years ago, so I may be one of the last people to ever use that, but they're not. <laughs> but um, so, so it's like a rubber mask, a latex mask, and it's, but it's glued down to your face. <laughs> so I couldn't I couldn't just take it off between setups or anything like that. It was on. And it was seven hours it took to put on, and, and then you've got to work for like 26 hours after that because we're a no-budget film, and you just go until you're done, you know. I had to do that twice. Yeah, the first time I think I, I, I was only, uh, I only worked for maybe 16, 17 hours after I got out of the makeup chair. The second time it was just a marathon. So I was in, but the, from the time I got into the chair to the time I was had the makeup off was probably over 30 hours. Uh, it, yeah, I was Texas in August. Um, and it's quite hot down there. I don't know if you've ever been to Texas, but uh, it was miserable. All that on you and the heat and oh my god, I'd say it wasn't a pleasant experience at all. <laughs> and then what was Toby no, I kind like? Of had to, I, sorry, I'm sorry. No, you go on. I, I said I kind of had to. I, I had to kind of go into a Zen thing, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> otherwise I would just rip it off. I, you know, I had to go. I'd find a happy place and just go there because it was so physically uncomfortable. Uh, and you know, after the hours kept building up, I thought, God, this is never going to end. You know, I had to convince myself it will be over at some point. I will have this makeup off. Oh, that's you tough. know, you you asked me what was Toby like to work with? Yeah, what was he like to work with? Uh, Toby was um, so he's kind of an enigmatic dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he actually sort of uh, Kim Hankel, who who was the screenwriter. Well, they co-wrote and co-directed, but um, Cam, the writer, was constantly on the set, always, uh, he was constantly rewriting, and then he, he sort of wrangled the actors. He gave active direction more mm-hmm. than Toby did. Toby was kind of camera direction, you know, was really head-to-head with the cinematographer with Daniel uh, Pearl all the time, working things out, and uh, boy, did they go around sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> Um so as far as direct, you know, acting direction, I got very little from, from Toby. Toby. Just angles, so how, how to move, that sort of thing. Of course, over the years, you're always asked the question about the dinner scene, because that was a very tough shoot for you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it sure turned out beautifully, though. But by that point, you know, I think in retrospect, years, years, years later, I kind of understand what Toby was doing. Because he pushed, at that point, we were pushed to the point of just exhaustion. Everybody was hot and miserable and tired and pissed off. We all hated each other. We just said, you know, I just want to go home. I want to have a beer and, and uh, some sex and a nap, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, and a long nap. I think I slept for like 24 hours after that. But um, it shows. 
in the in the in the film. I mean, the, the tension level was such a such a crescendo, really, in that scene. And uh, then you know, when he got what he wanted, it was like that's it. It's a wrap. Let's go home. It's crazy to think. You know, we all watch this movie and. No one even realizes what you went through to bring us that film. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 43 years later. Yeah, I'm still you know. talking about it. Well, of course, last year we sadly lost Gunnar. I'd say it's quite hard. Yes. You traveled around quite a bit doing conventions and everything. I'd say it's quite sad for you now to sit there and not have him, have him among you. Yeah, we lost uh, this, this year. We lost Gunnar, and last year we lost Marilyn. So it's. Uh, it's been a rough couple of years for, for us, you know, and, and uh, both of them were quite sudden. The gunner was diagnosed, you know, uh, was diagnosed, and after he was diagnosed, died just two months after or something. Oh, was. that is awful. I, mean, I, found out, I didn't find out, he, I didn't find out he was sick until he was in hospice and then he died within a week. I came back to the hospice had come in. Um, right. Marilyn was a total shock, you know, because it was just a sudden heart attack. And that was, uh, well, they were both shocking and horrible. Yeah. And, and it's horrible. very hard when, when it's at the stage where the hospice comes in. It's a very hard time for the family. A very hard time. Yes. Yes. Well, I'll move on from that now because I don't want to upset you. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre now, it isn't exactly a gory film. It's what you don't see that's so effective. So when you watch this movie after making it, did you think it warranted being banned in so many countries? Oh, okay. no, I thought it was ridiculous for it to be banned. There's nothing, there's no, uh, there's very little blood and guts in it. It's all subliminal, you know? It's all in your sick little mind. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we just opened that door. We just opened that door to, to we opened the door to images. We didn't pr- uh, produce the images. There's, I mean, look at it now, and, you know, look at it again. You know, for the new listeners out there, if you haven't seen it for a long time, watch it again, and you'll be surprised at how little blood and guts there are in this film, particularly compared to what's, what's on the screen now. My goodness. I know. What you see nowadays is crazy, and that was nothing but, I suppose, different times, different attitudes, do you know? Well, another thing is, I believe the truck driving away at the end of the movie was actually your truck. It was my sister's truck, and then I, uh, she gave it to me years and years later. And I had it for a while, and then I, it, uh, it broke down. It was in front of my apartment in Chicago, and uh, the ignition was broken. I couldn't uh, start it, and it, it was sitting for a couple of months, and uh, the Chicago, the city of Chicago took it away, thanks to a neighbor of mine that bitched about it sitting there. If you're listening, I hate your guts. Because <laughs> of you. You know who you are. By the time I wanted to get the truck, I had called them. I called the city and asked how long I had to pick it up. And uh, they said 30 days. So I thought, okay. So, because I, I had to get it, uh, a new license plate for it. And uh, I, I didn't have a lot of cash. I was waiting until my next pay check. So I got paid and went to, and, and got a plate for it and went down to the yard where they hauled those things. And uh, they couldn't find it. And then somebody said, oh, you need to go over to this trailer over there. And I went over there and and they looked at the records and said, oh, it went to the Crusher the day before yesterday. Oh, my God. And I said, the Crusher? I said, Crusher? Crusher, you crushed my fucking truck? Oh, my and I said, God. I called and said I had, they said I had 30 days. And I go, oh, if it's more than 15 years old, we only keep it for 10 days. <laughs> and we crush them. Well, let me tell you something. This is the city of Chicago. Those, they didn't crush that truck. Somebody who works there took the truck and retitled it and gave it to their son for a graduation present. Oh, for God's Nobody's going to crush a perfectly mm-hmm. good pickup truck. Uh, and, and But it's Chicago, you know, so... And can you... What are you going to do? That would sell for some money if you still had that now. God, it was, it, it was devastating to me. Yeah. I loved that truck. But then in in 2013, you reprised the role of Grandpa in Texas Chainsaw 3D. How did you feel when you got that call to get to play Grandpa again? Oh, it rocked. Uh, You know, I got the call from, first Kim Hinkle called and asked if it was okay if he gives out my information to some producer. Of course, Kim Kim Hinkle owns the rights to all things Chainsaw. And he said somebody had bought other rights and uh, they were interested in using some of the original cast members, could, I, could he give them my information? And I said, 
I'll go right ahead. And the next day, I get a phone call from Carl Mazikon from uh, Alaska, I think it was. And he said uh, that he was buying, they were doing a new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. And he said, we would be honored if you would consider reprising uh, the role of Grandpa. I said, are you kidding me? I've been waiting 40 years for, <laughs> for this phone call. And uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, when we were on set, he made me repeat that story to one of the other producers. <laughs> he got such a kick out of that. Well, I believe the set was so accurate that it was just like stepping back in time. Oh, yeah, he was so proud. He was so proud of that house that he actually had a film crew. He had a, a, a camera guy and somebody else there, camera and sound, a camera guy and a sound guy there, to film my face when I got out of the uh, crew van. And, and saw it for the first time. I got out in makeup when they, when they drove down to the set. Our uh, staging area was a couple of miles away from the actual set because it was shot at a huge um, decommissioned uh, army base in, in uh, Louisiana, which they use uh, a lot down there for, for film. And they had found a big vacant area, several acres, and they built that house there. Of course, it was just a facade. There was no back to it or anything. Mm -hmm. But it was very impressive. You know, he wanted to get my reaction. He was so proud of it. <laughs> oh, I'd say so. Of course, Gene. Well then, John, have you any projects that you're working on at the moment that you'd like to give a mention to? I have a couple things in the can that are post-production. Let's see. I just finished a uh, voicing an animated... Not animated, actually. Well, it's anim I guess it's a stop-motion uh, World War II film using, like, little plastic uh, army men. Yeah, and I voice uh, uh, the colonel. Uh, the CO at the thing. And that'll be out in August, I think. Um, I just finished a film with the same company a few months ago called Billy Timber, which is about uh, early uh, Irish and Scottish uh, immigrants to the Midwest of the United States. Mm. Who uh, This is supposedly based on a true story who uh, are cannibals. <laughs> oh, gosh. Cannibals. So, and this is the fourth film I've done with these guys. Uh, it's a new company. I can't think of the name of the production company. Damn, Bobby's going to kill me. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is the <laughs> project I've done with him. Um, and then I have a film called Devil's Inc. coming out, which uh, that should be out in the fall. It's in post production now. And I, I play the mayor of this town. And I, it's, a, it's a great role because he's a real asshole. I had a lot of fun with it. Awesome. He's a real jerk. <laughs> and that's called, it's called Devil's Inc. And it's, just, it's kind of horror, but kind of not. In fact, it's yeah. hard to explain. There are some there are some creepy things about it, but it's not. I wouldn't call it a true horror film. I, but I don't know what genre. I don't know how to pick it. And those are all what I'm having released uh, this year. Oh, oh, oh no, another one called Deviant Behavior, which I play a cop, a homicide cop, after a, a serial killer. And actually, the, the main character is an ex-cop, um, an ex-best friend of my character, who is now a private investigator, and they get involved together. And it's a marvelous piece. And I got to shoot in Texas. It was like shot in Corpus Christi, Texas, for mm. a few days down there. And that will be out uh, maybe by May. So I've had, I've had a busy, busy year, and then I have uh, two films uh, coming up. One's called uh, William Faust, and... Uh, the uh, horror film, mm -hmm. and the uh, cast list uh, reads like a two of uh, horror film actors. You know, they had to they called like everybody the whole eleven has to do a you know a couple pages. You know, so I'm playing a uh, cop again. And then uh, Victor Brooke Miller, who wrote uh, Friday the Thirteenth, the original one, uh, has something called Rock Paper Dead, uh, and it's also about a, a, a psychopathic murderer. Who uh, gets out of the, is released from the hospital for the criminal insane and considered cured, and of course goes back to his wicked ways. And I play the uh, a sadistic psychiatrist from the mental hospital. <laughs> Just meaty, nice little role. Just found out today the they're, they're, they're pitching it as a, 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 an anthology TV series. Well, um, I've seen a good bit about that online. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to it. Where are you, where are you from? Is it? Ireland. My grandmother was from Galway and my grandfather was from Clare. Where was your grandmother from? My grandmother was from uh, County Galway, Clarenbridge. No way. And my grandfather, 
And my grandfather was from Woodford, Whitehall, you know, on the river, on the Santa. Well, I'm in, I'm in yeah. Mayo. That's just right beside Galway. Yeah. For anybody who wants to follow you on social media, do you have a Facebook page or a Twitter page that they can follow you on? Yes, I do have a Facebook page. I have a Twitter page, but it's been hijacked. I, ha- I, got, I got hacked and hijacked. I haven't figured out how to get it back for myself. No so way. I don't even know what's on there. <laughs> somebody's trying to advertising uh, advertising like uh, uh, vitamin supplements and stuff and <laughs> and and uh, followed like uh, the limit of people I wanted to follow somebody and said you've reached your limit of 1,000 people or 10,000 people I thought what? I only, have, I only follow like 5 people and then I couldn't figure out how to I just like go oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm on Facebook well, listen, John, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Oh, no problem. No problem. The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Leisure Point Castle Bar.